Welcome. My name is Jesse and you are listening to The Wake Up Call. This show is about opening your eyes to how you've been living, bringing awareness to the standard you've been operating at, and helping you start living to your full potential. There are two ways I'll help you do this. One, by disciplining your mind, and two, by strengthening your body. It's time to take stock of your current performance and go to the next level. Let's do this. Welcome to today's edition of The Wake Up Call. Today I'm going to bust some myths and uh, hopefully give you some excuse-free training moving forward. So one of the uh, the greatest excuses of all time, it's going to be around for forever and ever, I believe, but this is something that I, I find unacceptable, especially for people who have great goals and ambitions of being strong, athletic, and just looking and feeling amazing, is I don't have time to train. Jesse, look... I, you don't un- you don't understand Jesse. My situation is different to every other person's on the planet. You just don't get it. I just literally don't have time to train. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Let's cut the bullshit, shall we? If it's important to you, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. So if you're somebody who is low on time, maybe you're short on space, and you still want to train. So let's say it is a priority and you need to, you know, slap yourself in the face and, you know, call yourself out in your own ridiculousness and you need to, you know, get something happening and you're not sure where to start or what to do or what equipment you should perhaps purchase, I would encourage you to look into kettlebells. So this is something I actually, uh, I encouraged a a student of mine recently to look into buying a set of kettlebells. So kettlebells, I'll go through the different styles of kettlebell in a moment. But I encouraged uh, one of my students to purchase uh, two or three bells. So a 12, uh, I think it was a 16, uh, a 12, a 20, and a 24, I think. So the reason for those uh, weight selections is it would allow her to do presses. So typically when you do kettlebell training, you stay at the same weight for a long period of time. So with the training system that I follow and I utilize and um, incorporate with my coaching from Strong First, um, that's the company who I did my kettlebell certification through. They are a no nonsense, they have a no nonsense approach to kettlebell training or just training, period. And this is one of the great things with kettlebells. They are so versatile. They give you tremendous amounts of options um, and adaptability to work your whole body without having to, you know, invest tens of thousands of dollars into equipment. Okay. But I encouraged one of my uh, students to get three kettlebells, two or three kettlebells, obviously budget dependent. So that way she'd be able to do presses, she'd be able to do some rows, she'd be able to do her squats, and she'd be able to do some heavier stuff like her two-handed swings. So they're they're really quite versatile. If you get two or three um, at the appropriate sizes and weights, it allows you to effectively strengthen your whole body. So if you know anything about, you know, the... (laughs) the common or the commercial type of gym, you walk in there and there's fucking machines everywhere. You know, it, it, almost, makes, it almost makes me me embarrassed by, you know, the, the types of setups and the amount of money that gets wasted in commercial gyms these days is fucking ridiculous. All of these machines, you've got, you know, your treadmills, your cross trainers, your bikes, and then you've got all these big, you know, plate loaded or pin loaded machines. They just take up so much space for one. And two, they're just, they're really expensive. And especially for what you get out of them, you have to have one machine, which probably cost a couple grand, to do one exercise. It's it's absurd. Anyway, <laughs> the more I train people, the more I train myself, uh, and th- the students that I work with, the more I'm realizing, you know, how little gear you actually do need. The more I know about the human body and what it needs from a functional standpoint, from a safety and a health standpoint, but also from a performance standpoint, the more I'm loving kettlebells and what they give you. They're super versatile. They're very, like they take up no space. Their footprint, so by footprint, I mean just the space that they take in terms of you know, how to store them. It's, it's really low, it's very little. So they're space saving and they're incredibly effective tools for developing strength and conditioning might I add okay and it's this really comes down to how you use them it's like any piece of equipment you use some people have all the gear but no idea okay so you know kettlebells are like any piece of equipment you buy 
There's a lot of different styles and colors and ranges and different options out there. Kettlebells are no different, okay? But with the kettlebell, there's two main styles. We have what are called classic bells, so classic kettlebells, and pro-grade kettlebells. Now, the difference between the two. Classic kettlebells are different in their shape and size. So the dimensions for each kettlebell is different. This means the lighter the kettlebell, the smaller the size that it actually is, and the thinner the handle. So that, that would mean a four or a six kilo kettlebell would be significantly smaller in its size and shape compared to say a 40 or a 48 kilo bell, all right? Um, so yeah, as the weight goes up, the bell gets larger and the handle becomes thicker. So it's a wider and it's a, it's a harder, or it's a thicker handle to hold onto, okay? Pro-grade bells, they are all the same dimensions regardless of the weight. So they are uniform in their size. So th I've got pro-grade, I've got both, just uh, as, a, as an FYI, I've got both. I've got classics and I've got pro-grade. But the pro-grade bells that I've got, they range from six to 40 kilograms. So the six and the 40, they are the exact same size. They are the same size with the same thickness of handle, okay? So you might be kind of picturing this like, wow, you know, you've got the classics, you've got a six kilo, which is really little, and then you've got a 40, which is really big, and the handle's very thick. And then you've got the pro-grade, which, you know, I've got a green one that's six kilos, and I've got a white one that's 40 kilos. They look the same. If you didn't know, you know, what weight they were and you put them side by side, you'd think, what's the difference? The only difference is the color. Then you've got to pick one up. One lifts off the ground like it's a balloon. Then you try and lift the other one. You're like, holy crap, that's pretty heavy. So, but the point is here, the styles, one isn't inherently better than the other. They're just different, okay? I've got both and I use both for my own training and also with my students. Um, but it really depends on what you're doing, your current level of strength, uh, and your level of experience as well. So this is something, if you've never used kettlebells before, you might kind of have a play around with them and get, have a preference to one over the other. And it's not right or wrong, it's probably just you know what suits you, your current level, and your frame, your build. Um, in my experience coaching, um, typically smaller framed individuals prefer the classic bells. They seem to sit a little bit snugger uh, in the rack position. So that's where you would hold it on the chest in between the forearm and the bicep for, for things like cleans and presses or half rack work or double rack. So that's where you've got two kettlebells on your chest. Um, whereas larger frame people typically prefer the larger pro-grade bells. Um, you know, it's not right or wrong. It's just a preference thing. Um, but it really depends on what you want to do with these kettlebells. What I love about kettlebells and the people who are serious who use kettlebells is the no nonsense approach. There's no fluff. There's no gimmicks. It's not about you know who's got the be who's wearing the best gear. They just fucking get on with the work, which you know ultimately that's what it comes down to, regardless of your goal. So my advice to you is if you are going to look into kettlebells, do a bit of research. Have a look online. See what you think about you know the pro grade versus the classics. Actually, maybe go into a store, not a Kmart or Big W. So actually, go to a fitness store, someone who sells fitness or strength equipment, um, and have a bit of a play around. Pick them up, have a look, feel the width of the handle, the thickness. You know, try and put it in the rack position, um, or seek out a coach who can maybe you know give you a bit of instruction, and you can have a play around with them. So that way, you can find the best fit for you. Um, in saying that, so like for me personally, I typically use pro grades more often than not because of the uniformity, the, the size of the kettlebell is the same from lightweights all the way up to heavyweights. So that means I don't really have to change my technique on any of the exercises. I know that if I'm doing you know presses or something with a 20, when I go up to the 24, it's not really gonna feel that different. The dimensions of the bell are pretty much the same. It's just an extra four kilos heavier, okay? In saying that, when I was doing my uh, my training in preparation for the SFG1, so that's a Strong First Kettlebell Level 1 certification, I actually preferred using uh, classic bells, the smaller bells. Um, and the reason was that it seemed to, to transition and flow a little bit quicker through the air. So this, this took me literally thousands of reps, 
it's not an exaggeration. Like every training session that I would do, I would train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the lead up to my certification. I would be doing, across the training week, I would be doing hundreds of swings, cleans, and or snatches. So I would kind of, I would use both. I would, I would use my classics, uh, my pro grades, and I would uh, also try out classics. And the handles do have a different finish with classics to pro grade as well. So that's something to be mindful of as well. If you're going to be doing lots of snatches where you're transitioning the kettlebell from in between the legs and then having it finish up overhead, the bell is repeatedly sliding around the hand and the palm over and over again. So you want to make sure that the handle is very smooth so it doesn't, you know, bunch up the skin and create a lot of calluses. So you want it to be smooth. The grip isn't, it's not a death grip if you're doing something like snatches or swings for that matter. The grip's firm enough to hold the bell, but your hips are doing a lot of the work for you. The hands are really just hooks and your arms are ropes in the swing, this is. Um, yeah, so you've got to find what works best for you. I hope that makes sense. All right, moving on to the exercises themselves. So if you have goals and you want to get really strong, if you want to improve your mobility, so that is just, you know, how your body moves and feels and functions. So it might mean, oh man, my back's really stiff. Okay, that would be a, a great indicator that you need to improve your hip mobility, your upper back mobility, and probably ankle mobility as well. Kettlebell training will allow you to do all of that very efficiently, very effectively, okay? Um, so if you wanna get strong, you stay with the same weight for, for a period of time with the kettlebell, so it's not one where you just increase by one kilo per per training session, no, no, no. You will actually stay on the same kettlebell for quite a while. So you have to earn your reps and you have to earn your graduation, so to speak, to the heavier kettlebell. But they'll also help you stay very, very athletic. So this is something I see people who start, as they get older, they start slowing down. I actually mean like physically slowing down. Their cadence, everything that they do, just goes down, gets lower and lower. It's like they can't get into the fourth gear or fifth gear because they never actually put themselves in a position to figure out, oh fuck, do I even have fourth gear anymore? Can I actually accelerate? Like, can I run, can I sprint, or can I do anything at a high, high threshold, high level of acceleration? Most people, it's just due to the lifestyle that they lead. You know, you get up, it's very monotonous, get up, have a shower, stroll to the kitchen table, sit down, eat the breakfast, stroll back to the bathroom, do the teeth, stroll to the car, sit in the car, drive to work, and it's all like first gear or second gear. The only time you get to fourth or fifth gear is in the car. And that's why your body slows down. That's why your body stiffens up, and that's why your body becomes weak. Because if you don't expose your body to these different gears, so to speak, you know, we do slow things, we do fast things. If you don't expose your body to that, you're gonna lose the ability to actually do it at all. So, in terms of a kettlebell session, let's say, for example, you've got yourself a couple kettlebells. You've got, I'm not gonna go into specific weights, but I'm just gonna give you a framework of what a kettlebell session would look like. You would do a dynamic warm up. So the warm ups that I prescribe for my students have seven exercises. Three activation exercises to switch on muscles and get them active as the name implies, for the work ahead. Then we do four mobility drills to increase range of movement or restore it. So maybe you've just been sleeping or maybe you've had a long day at work, rounded in front of a keyboard. We wanna open you up and make sure that your body and your joints are able to get into a host of different positions, okay? And then you would do one or several warm up sets for the first exercise on the program. Could be squats, could be swings, could be presses, could be rows. Doesn't matter. You'd pick one of the you would pick the first movement and you do a couple warm up sets, either body weight or with a light bell. Now this is what I love so much about kettlebell training, and this is <laughs> this is where it weeds out the weak. For the people who are always looking for a shiny object, ooh, a butterfly, or, oh, fuck, that's new, that looks fancy, that's in vogue at the moment, I wanna try that. Those people are weeded out super quickly by kettlebell training, because if they are not in it for the long haul, they will disqualify themselves from the process of kettlebell training. 
because the kettlebell training involves very few exercises and you do them over and over and over and over again. And this is where people's attention span kills them. Attention span of a fucking goldfish. It's like, oh, swings, swings. Oh, boring. Want something else? No, you still suck at swings. You need more reps. You need more practice. Okay, but a great combination. If you get to do a training session or have a program, a long-term program that you follow, a good one is get-ups and swings. The Turkish get-up involves your whole body. So if you don't know what a Turkish get-up is, it is where you're laying on the floor with a kettlebell on one side. You use two hands to grab the kettlebell. One hand holds the bell, the other one locks on top. You use two hands to roll onto your back. You press the kettlebell up overhead. And from a lying down position, so supine, laying face up, lying on your back with the kettlebell overhead, you follow, you follow a series of steps to progressively stand up with that kettlebell overhead the entire time. And then you have to get all the way back down to the floor using basically the reverse of the movements that got you to standing. So something like a Turkish get up, it involves your entire body. Tip to toe. Shoulders, hips, upper back, triceps, core. Everything is worked. This is a slow methodical movement. It requires a tremendous amount of stability. So initially just as a, as a, as a safety measure, as a protocol, there is a standard that you actually have to meet before doing Turkish get-ups. You actually have to have full shoulder flexion. So that means from standing, keeping your spine neutral, so neutral means the natural arches of your spine, you should be able to lift your arm directly up overhead with your bicep near your ear without any compensation. So that means your lower back cannot arch. It means your arm is vertical or near vertical with your elbow locked out, okay? If you cannot meet that standard, you should not be doing Turkish get-ups. You need to work on overhead mobility. So it could be a combination of thoracic, so upper back. It might mean uh, lats, it might mean triceps, or it might be a combination of things. It might be pecs as well. You need to open up and improve your mobility through that area so you can get your arm directly overhead. But a Turkish get-up is what is called a grind. So there are two types of movements when it comes to kettlebells. We have a grind, slow, controlled lifts. Okay, that's a Turkish get-up as an example. It's also a press, it's also a squat, it's also a deadlift. Those are involved in that same category. Then we have our other exercise, which might be a kettlebell swing. Could be two-handed, could be one-handed. But kettlebell swings are ballistics. They are explosive and they are powerful. Fast movements, quick lifts. And the swings work your hips, hamstrings, glutes, core, and your quads. So while one of your exercises is very slow, very methodical, very controlled, the other one is bang, in your face, fucking go. Yep. So we see we've got two sides of the performance coin here, okay? F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. If we want to develop and become powerful, ballistics are fucking amazing. Force equals mass times acceleration. The weight isn't super heavy in relation to the heaviest weight you'd be able to lift off the ground, but you are moving at high speed. The acceleration is very, very high. Then we have the grinds. They are typically heavy in weight relative to your strength and skill level, and you are working for a long period of time. The load is heavy, but it's slow and controlled. So you're getting both sides of the coin there. Fantastic. Well balanced, isn't it? So a program, because everybody wants to know like the X's and O's, what does an actual program look like, Jesse? Well, now you're gonna think this is too simple, but it's not. Well, it's, it's, you're gonna think it's too easy, but it's not, it's very simple though. You do three to five get-ups each side, and you do 50 to 100 swings in sets of five or 10. So what does that look like? You would do your dynamic warm-up, and then you would proceed with Turkish get-ups. So I always start people with body weight. Even if you've been doing it for five or 10 years, or maybe you're a brand new person, I don't care. 
If you wanna lift a heavy weight, show me and demonstrate that you can do it with your own body weight. Don't be fucking lazy. This is the difference between the people who get exceptional results and people who get really average results. They take pride in the small details. I don't care if you could Turkish get up 48 kilos. Show me your body weight get up. If a 48's easy, you should be able to absolutely nail every aspect of a body weight get up. Shouldn't you? I think so. So you do a body weight get up each side. Then you grab your bell, whatever your working weight is. Do one rep each side, have a break. Do another one each side, have a break. And you do three to five reps each side. Bang. Get ups, finished. Then you start your swing practice. And I want you to take note of what I just said there. Your swing practice. It's not a fucking workout. When it comes to kettlebells training, or not even kettlebells, this is across the board. When you go to do your strength training, it is training, it is planned, it is premeditated, and it is progressive in nature. This is something I want you guys to get through your head. When you are training, you are not doing a workout per se. A workout indicates you're doing a series of different exercises, perhaps random, perhaps not, and the intention is to just get hot and sweaty and fucking tired. So we are doing a swing practice. We are practicing the skill of strength in the form of kettlebell swings. And you do them in sets of five or 10, okay? So let's say you're doing 50 swings. If you're brand new to kettlebell training, I would start you off with 10 sets of five. So if you've been doing some strength training for a while and you think, holy shit, 10 sets is a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. And the reason that I would prescribe 10 sets of five instead of five sets of 10 is because I'm looking for power. I want you to nail the movement. I am now giving you 10 opportunities to refine and develop and improve your swing as opposed to five sets of 10. Which one would you get done quicker? Five sets of 10. But that's not what, I don't care how long it takes you. It takes as long as it takes, at least initially. But the goal of the swing, the primary goal of the kettlebell swing is power development. I am not looking for sloppy swings. I am looking for powerful and crisp swings. Every single fucking one. Okay? I say to my students, we are developing power first, conditioning second. Conditioning is a great byproduct of doing ballistic work. Okay? But don't let your swings get lazy. Don't let your swings become labored or sloppy or slow. If that's the case, if your swings look and feel different than your first rep, park the bell, put it down under control safely and rest for a little bit longer and see if you can regain that power. So that's what we're looking at. And there's your practice done. There's your training done. Three to five get-ups each side. So we're getting muscle balance and symmetry left to right. And then swings. We're developing that power, a ballistic, a fast movement. Bang, done, tick, move on with your day. So that'll take you, depending on how many swings you do and depending on your level of um, training, if you're a, a new, if you're a beginner, if you're a novice or if you're maybe intermediate or an advanced lifter, will determine how many reps you should do. Um, if in doubt, do less, not more. So if you want to you know, work really, really hard, I'm all for that, but I, want you, I would prefer that you did three awesome get-ups each side opposed to doing four or five where you start getting sloppy and rushed and trying to speed through the movement because you're getting tired same thing for swings i would rather 50 powerful amazing swings than 100 where you start getting sloppy the speed of the bell is slowing down and it just looks like your lower back's about to pop out of your out of your body <laughs> so that's that's my recommendation Okay, that's, that's an example training session. You warm up, three to five get-ups each side, 50 to 100 swings, bang, finished. Another great pairing of exercises is kettlebell cleans and presses. So again, when I, when I refer to you know, what equipment perhaps you should get or look into, it really depends on your budget, your, uh, 
the space that you have available and how far you want to go with your training. For me, I'm going to train until I die. That's not an exaggeration. I've seen some old people around recently and fuck, I don't want to end up like them. I really don't. They looked old and decrepit and frail and if a gust of wind came, they'd probably fall over and fracture a hip. Like that, that's a huge incentive for me to invest my time, effort and money into my body because I know that I'm gonna have a vehicle that's gonna allow me to live better and longer. Okay, but uh, cleans, you can do single arm. So if you're not sure what a clean is, you've got a kettlebell on the floor, okay? One hand holds the handle. The other hand rests on top to keep your shoulders square. You swing the kettlebell back between your legs. You push your hips through. The kettlebell comes up your body and then the, the bell actually flips. It goes around the handle and you push up into that handle. So that's the rack position. The kettlebell is sitting diagonally across your palm. The bell itself is between the forearm and the bicep and you are standing tall, okay? It's called a standing plank. So you're not just hanging off your hips, belly pushed out, shoulders behind your hips. No, you're standing tall, everything's tight. So you might be doing some cleans. Maybe it's, you know, you do one to five reps each side, okay? Cleans are your ballistic movement and your presses are your grind movement. Again, both sides of the performance coin. One is, sm uh, one is slow and one is fast. Again, cleans, the focus is on technique. So by technique, there are a few points you should be meeting. There are standards, okay? The standards is that the kettlebell should travel the shortest distance possible. So that means if you hike the kettlebell between your legs and then it flips out and then it comes back into your body, so it's doing like this big arc and then it like comes into your body with a, a God almighty thud and you feel the impact of the bell. That's, no, that's not the shortest distance possible. The shortest distance possible is that the kettlebell is hiked between the legs with a straight arm. It then comes up your body. So your elbow actually comes slightly behind your body and then you push up into the handle. And then on the down phase, the reverse happens. Your elbow comes back, kettlebell comes down your body and then you either load back into the backswing for your next clean, or it goes into the backswing and then you park the bell if you finished your set. The elbow is close to your body and the kettlebell and you become one. That means there should be no thudding or impact of the kettlebell as you receive it into the rack. If that happens, you need to refine your technique. Maybe it means you need to loosen the grip off so you can punch up into the handle. Maybe you need more hip drive so that you know you don't have to pull the kettlebell with your arm. There is a little bit of pulling, but it is a hip dominant exercise or movement. Hope that makes sense. Kettlebell cleans. Great for developing unilateral strength. Single arm, single leg. Uh, single arm, I should say. So it's a unilateral in terms of the arm. We're working one arm at a time, but we're bilateral through the legs and the hips because both feet are planted on the floor, both hips are pushing through at the same time. But it can be done bilaterally as well. If you have a pair of kettlebells, you can do double cleans. That's very fun, very fun. Anyway, moving on to presses. With presses, we work in ladders. So typically, presses are heavy, okay? And the way I like to prescribe them, I have different brackets for different phases of training. So for people who are new to presses, you know, we start with one to two presses each side because <laughs> there's no point me giving you three sets of 10 if you've never done the exercise before because to be frank, you're probably gonna suck at it. But if I give you some very clear and concise instructions on, hey, this is how you're going to do the exercise, just do one really good one for me. So I teach you to clean the bell or we cheat curl it into the rack and then you're gonna brace your whole body nice and tight quads, bum, abs, shoulders are down, and then you breathe behind your teeth, drive the bell up overhead, lock it out, pull it back into the rack, and then park it. Your likelihood of hitting one good rep is going to be much higher than hitting 10 good reps straight out of the gate. Yeah, does that make sense? 
Do something once, do it really well. Park the bell. So you do one each side, have a rest. Then you do two each side and have a rest. And then as you get through the brackets, you progressively increase the volume. So volume is total reps, sets times reps. Okay, I hope that makes sense so far. Um, so we're starting light and we're focusing on creating whole body tension. So this is a phrase I want you to remember. Plug any leaks with tension. So if your back is arching, your lower back is arching, it means your abs are not working hard enough. You are leaning into extension. So that's lower back arching, extension. It means the muscles on the front are not doing a good enough job of preventing that extension from occurring. Okay? There are three neural drivers. What I mean by this is you get a neurological effect of tensing a lot harder. When you tense harder, you create more stability. With more stability, there is less compensation from your body. So that means we don't have body parts moving, which we don't want to. Example, the lower back I just mentioned. But the three neural drivers are glutes, abs, grip. Okay? Squeeze your ass cheeks together like you're trying to crack a wall up between your cheeks. Brace your abs like I'm about to stand in front of you and punch you at full force. So one of my favorite um, coaching tools is a broomstick. And all of this stuff, just to preface it, because I know there's gonna be that one person who says that's a bit inappropriate, Jesse. I always ask my clients if they feel comfortable with hands-on coaching. Nothing inappropriate, but it's tactile feedback, touch feedback, okay? So I grab the broomstick, and if I have someone standing tall, I say, squeeze your butt cheeks, I'll poke their bum to see if they're squeezing, if they're tight. And it's it's very simple to see if they're tight or not. Then I will tap them on the midsection to see if they're bracing. Okay, it could be from the side, or if I don't think they're bracing hard enough, maybe I'll go and give them a chop with my uh, a karate chop through the midsection. And then the other one is grip. If you're doing a, a, a military press, you've got the kettlebell in the rack, let's say it's in the left hand, you got the kettlebell in the left hand, you make a fist with your right hand, a white knuckle fist. You're trying to get that fist, and that forearm, and that opposite arm as tight as fucking possible. Okay? You're creating as much tension as possible. Glutes, abs, and grip. And then you drive that kettlebell up overhead under a controlled manner. So it's not an explosive lift. It's nice and smooth. It's controlled. You breathe behind the shield. The shield is your abs, and you slowly exhale. So there is a certain breathing style that we use where we basically breathe behind the teeth, where it's a slow release of air. So that way we maintain tension under load. Okay? So one of the things, again, what I love about kettlebells is that they force you to focus on your technique and the immediate task at hand. You can't have your focus anywhere else. So it doesn't matter if you've had a shit sleep. It doesn't matter if you had the worst day at work. When it comes time to lift a kettlebell, your focus is on lifting the kettlebell. Nothing else matters at that present time. Because if your mind is elsewhere, if your mind wanders, or you're just not paying attention, or you're not concentrating, the kettlebell is going to level you. <laughs> the kettlebell is going to give you direct feedback to say, hey, dickhead, switch on, wake up. And especially, one of the things we do with kettlebells is we often do it uh, at a certain tempo or in a certain time period. So let's say you're pressing. You might press every minute on the minute. So in a scenario like that, I'll, I'll get my phone and I'll open up the interval timer that I have and I'll set that up in one of my racks. So it's just displaying the time. So I'll say, hands on bell, three, two, one. My student will clean the bell or they'll start pressing. Once they've done all of their reps, they park the bell and they relax. The clock's still ticking away. And they know with about five seconds left, they have to set up for the next set. Sometimes I won't say anything to see if they're paying attention. But it gives you feedback of when to work and when to rest. So contrary to popular belief, you don't have to flog yourself for an hour straight. You alternate in periods of work and rest. This is how you develop strength, but it's also great in terms of developing conditioning. This is one of the things I like about kettlebells. It's called the what the hell effect. 
you swing a kettlebell really hard, really intensely for five or 10 reps, park it, relax. So your heart rate goes very high. And then in that rest period, we're trying to get it as low as possible. Nasal breathing, shaking the arms and legs out fast and loose. As Soon as it's time to go, bang, back on the bell. So if you're working in tune with a clock or a timer, you have to stay alert as to when the next set begins. Because it's either gonna beep or it's give you a three, two, one. And if you're not paying attention, that clock will leave you behind. And you have some swings to pay at the end, or you'll have some presses, or whatever it might be. But it also means that you have to learn the tension and relaxation techniques. Tension means get tight, squeeze, brace. Get your body to contract, to give you stability. So we work hard for however long the set goes for. And then we relax. As soon as you've done your work, fast and loose. So it's like you're trying to shake your arms and legs out. It might be a bit of shadow boxing, just kicking your legs. It's like you're trying to get a bit of water off your body. So we're working both sides of that performance coin. Work intensely, relax. We're going from a period of stressing the body, okay? Sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight response, we're applying a stress to the body and then we relax. It's a form of stress inoculation as well. How quickly can you recover and adapt to that stress you've just given the body? And you do that over and over again. Stress, relax, stress, relax, stress, relax. And eventually over time with practice, your body gets better at dealing with stress. In this case, it is lifting a weight whether it's really fast or really heavy. So if you've only got 30 to 45 minutes or even less, you can accomplish more than most people would in a full hour at a commercial gym. It's staggering how slow people move when they're at a commercial gym. No intensity, just going through the motions. Program says three sets of 10 to 12, yep. I'll push this machine, I'll pull this pulley or do whatever it says and then I'll just have a breather because I've earned it. Have you? Not really. <laughs> I joke. I digress. But if you've never used a kettlebell before, let me give you a little bit of advice. I would highly, highly encourage you to get some coaching from an experienced coach who knows what they're doing because lifting kettlebells is very different than using a barbell or lifting a pair of dumbbells. The kettlebell moves differently. You have to hold it differently. It feels different in your hand and it requires a great understanding of how to move your body. But this is also why we don't use 4 million different exercises. There are a handful of exercises within the kettlebell world. And then within those exercises, we use what's called specialized variety. So let's say you are getting a little bit bored with your training. You need a little bit of variety to spice things up. Maybe instead of doing, you know, 100 two-handed swings, I get you to do 100 single arm swings. 50 on your left, 50 on your right. So that way, we're, we're giving you a different stimulus. Your body now has to prevent rotation. So it's an anti-rotation exercise. The core has to work a lot harder. The obliques, the muscles down the side, are creating lateral stability. And it gives you something different to think about. It's a slightly different technique. And it's a bit more unilateral work for you as well, which is never a bad thing. Unilateral, single arm, okay? So if you want some coaching, if you're not sure where to start or where to look, have a look on the Strong First website. So that's one word. Just type into the Google machine, Strong First. And have a look if there's an instructor in your area. So you can get a no-nonsense and a safe approach to kettlebell training. So you do need to know the fundamentals. You have to understand the safety aspect. And there is a huge component of safety when lifting kettlebells. Yes, we train hard. Yes, it's very methodical, but it's a safety first approach. And you'll also get troubleshooting drills to refine your technique. So let's say you're struggling with the same thing over and over again. You just can't quite get your technique right. There are a host of troubleshooting drills that we can use to clean up, refine, and make your movement pattern more efficient. 
especially if you plan to train at home or you know maybe you've got kids or you're on you're just training on your own who's giving you feedback do you know what you should be looking out for so let's say you're doing a turkish get up what's step one? Oh, press the kettlebell overhead no it's not it's getting into position with your hand on the kettlebell do there's there's very a very detailed approach to kettlebell lifting and if you want to be in it for the long term so think longevity how you're going to feel and move in 5 10 15 20 years from now you know paying for coaching will save you down the track not just time effort but in terms of injury prevention as well one of the things that i've uh, i learned from a mentor of mine as well is to to read the manual and that sounds so so simple how many people have ever been to a course and they go to the course and then they never look at the notes they got they took there's a lot of people who do that i've still got my training manual from my certification i keep it in my training facility and i refer back to it every single week every single week i give my students feedback on their lifts so there are movement standards which need to be met and they are not easy I was explaining to one of my one of my students this morning about when I was doing the cert. I was doing the Turkish get up. So the standard for men is 24 kilo kettlebell. You do one rep each side, and you've got I think it's 11 standards that need to be met. 11 for the Turkish get up. And I remember it was a very hot day. There's a lot of us in the room. I had a bit of sweat on my foot, and one of the standards is the kettlebell at uh, the foot on the kettlebell side cannot leave the ground so the foot must be planted during tall sit during low sweep up to standing from the lunge and the reverse of these actions my foot slipped with uh, because it was sweaty and i knew it straight away this is when i was being tested on the lift itself i knew immediately as soon as my heel come off the ground i was like fuck like there was there was no hesitation because i'd studied the manual and I'd practiced the lift so many fucking times. And I went from, I think, tall sit to low sweep and my foot moved. My foot slipped and I knew it straight away. I was like, I just had to keep my composure and do the rest of the lift as best I could. And it, it was noted in my feedback. You know, I passed. Um, but that's one of the standards. And if you understand what the standards are and you know how to meet them, then you can take control of your training and troubleshoot the necessary areas. But if you don't know what the standards are, what are you gonna troubleshoot? You have no fucking idea. So for, for, that's the Turkish get up, it's got 11 standards. The swing has 10 standards, which should be met. And you, initially, you're probably not gonna hit them all. You might hit a couple, and then gradually you find, you know, you identify what is the next big one that needs to be addressed, and you address that and you refine it, and you practice, and you chop wood, and you sharpen your skills, and you get more efficient, and then you work on the next one, and the next one, until you can meet all 10 standards. And then once you can meet those standards, the next question is this. Can you do that for every single swing? Not just for the first one. What if you're doing 160 swings? Can you do, can you meet all those standards for every swing? That's a, that's a big ask, that's a tall order. And the answer is going to be probably no most of the time, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't strive for it. Because if you strive for perfection, you're probably going to meet excellence. So maybe you're going to hit eventually, maybe to start with you hitting 80% of your swings, meeting all the standards, and then you might bump it up to 82. And then you practice and maybe you're thinking on one specific part of the swing that you want to improve. And then that set, you hit 10 out of 10. So bang, you're bumping up to an 85 percent success rate of meeting standards and then so forth you just practice and practice and practice getting better and better every single week it's like parking your bell for if you are new to kettlebells parking the bell is the way that you set the bell down so you finished your lift or you finished your set whatever it is you park the bell you slowly control the bell back to where it came from so in my facility, I've got the, the gym tiles, the rubber gym tiles. They're one meter by one meter. 
I encourage my students to put the kettlebell towards the front of the line. So they stand over the bell, let's say it swings, they step back into position, unlock and chop. So they've loaded their hamstrings, they're in a good hinge stance. They do their swings. The way that you put the kettlebell down should be the reverse of how you start the set. Which means if you took a video and you watched the kettlebell hike to begin the set where you swing the kettlebell back between the legs, and then if you look at the way you park the bell on the down phase of your last rep, it should look the same. And I think I've gone through this, but I'm gonna go through it again because I think it, it, it needs repeating. Um, well, parking the bell, it's like parking your car. Okay, you put it within the lines. There are white lines in a parking lot, okay, in a car park. These are not suggestions. This is where you park your car, within the confines of those lines. Not across all four fucking lines, or across six bays, or across three bays. You've got one parking bay. Put your car in it. That's the same thing with your kettlebell. Your set is not done until you have safely parked the bell under control. You don't drop it, you don't let it fall, you don't let it roll away. Park the car, park your bell. But I remember when we were doing the certification and I was in, I think, the first round of um, people doing the snatch test. So a snatch is, it's a five minute snatch test. You've got 24 kilos for men. You've got to get the kettlebell from the ground up overhead in one uninterrupted motion 100 times. You've got five minutes to do it. You can park the kettlebell as often as you like. You can switch hands as often as you like. And you've got somebody there assessing you with a rep counter, clicking the reps off as you successfully complete them. I did my 100 reps and then I died for a few minutes. I took myself over to a corner and I was breathing, like my, my heart felt like it was about to come out of the chest and I was absolutely fucking exhausted. It's the most strenuous thing I've done in a long time, 100, 100 reps in five minutes, but I, I finished it. But anyway, after I'd recovered enough to slowly breathe and encourage some of the, some of the other guys who were in the next wave, they got to about four minutes 45 and one of these guys, he was doing his snatches and I think he had, I don't know, five reps to go. And at this point, everybody's cheering and encouraging, go, yeah, come on, couple, you got 10 seconds. And they're getting closer and closer and you can see these guys are straining, they're giving it everything they've got. They're absolutely rooted, they're absolutely exhausted at this point. But anyway, one of these guys, he did his last rep and he put his bell down, he, he let it go and then he ended up in a heap on the floor. And everyone was like, yeah, well done, clapping and over the moon. Everybody's just absolutely spent by the end of it. Anyway, at the end of that, we got our assessment and our feedback from our, uh, our instructor who was watching and took us through the, the testing. And this gentleman got his feedback. And uh, unfortunately, he did not park his kettlebell correctly on the last rep. So he'd done 99 successful reps and the 100th did not count because he did not meet the standard of the snatch. So this poor bastard has done 100 reps only to fall one short because he did not park the kettlebell correctly. And I know right now you're thinking, oh no, that would be so frustrating. How unlucky. It's not unlucky. It's not unlucky. We all received the same training manual. We all received the same standards. And those standards were actually read out to us directly before the snatch test. So there was no excuse of, I didn't know what to do. Everybody knew what to do. Everybody knew the standard. Everybody knew what had to be done to successfully pass the snatch test. He lost concentration. His body got to a certain level of fatigue where he thought his set was finished before the kettlebell was on the ground. So a gentleman unfortunately failed his snatch test. I, I often refer to that one because it's, uh, it's the best example I have of somebody working really, really hard and still failing when it comes to kettlebells. So it doesn't mean he's a failure. It just means for that particular test, at that particular moment in time, he failed. He got a chance to retest but that's, uh, that's the way that you, you should treat your kettlebell practice. Treat it with care. Treat it like you are being tested. Treat it like your coach is there 
watching you is four or five feet away, watching you from the side, critiquing your technique. I, I often joke with my students and I kind of say, you know, if you've got your solo session or if you're training on your own, WWJD, what would Jesse do? You know, if, if you're doing a set, it's like, what would I say? If you just done a set of 10 swings, what would I be saying? Or what would I be critiquing? What questions would I be asking? So then you can ask yourself those same questions and you can refine your own technique to make it better, to make it more efficient, to make it stronger. So the ultimate portable gym, the kettlebell, you have a plethora of opportunities and different options. You can squat, you can swing, you can press, you can pull, you can snatch, you can carry, you can anything. You can. You are only limited by your imagination. So if you're wondering, you know, you've been thinking about maybe doing strength training for a while or you're stuck on time or you don't have a lot of space available to you, or maybe you travel a lot for work, get yourself a couple bells, get some coaching on some simple, some fundamental staple exercises and practice them. Because the more you practice something correctly, the better you will become at it. So if you want more information, uh, or if you want to uh, inquire about coaching, please get in touch with me via message, or you can email me. My email is fullersc at gmail.com. So that is spelt F-U-L-L-A-S-C at gmail.com. So I wish you well on your training, and if you are about to embark on your kettlebell training, power to you. Keep it simple, keep the standards high, and remember you've got those two different movements. You've got your ballistics, highly powerful, quick lifts, and you have your grinds. Heavy, slow, controlled lifts, okay? Make no mistake about it, the kettlebell is the ultimate portable gym. If you loved the wake up call, found it entertaining, or got some benefit out of listening, I would appreciate you helping me to spread the word. Please share it with a friend or on social media so that you can pay it forward and give someone else the opportunity to improve themselves like you just have. Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon for another episode.